Land reform in Africa is not just about righting a historical wrong. Today it is also about food security, about political and economic corruption, and in many cases about fundamental human rights. We'll tackle some of these complicated issues next on The Line. This is On The Line and I'm Aisha Tanzeen. Decades after the end of apartheid in South Africa, many are still waiting for the fruits of freedom, the promises of land reform to be fulfilled, while in Zimbabwe, a radical land redistribution is blamed for an increase in hunger and poverty. Controversial land grabs in other countries are possibly making the situation worse. Joining us in our Washington studios to talk about what should be done is George Ayete, president of the Free Africa Foundation. In our New York studios, we have Ambassador John Campbell, former U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, presently with the Council on Foreign Relations. And on Skype from Ottawa, Canada, we have Obang Metho, Executive Director of Solidarity Movement for New Ethiopia. I welcome you all to the show. Ambassador Campbell, I want to start with you. Africa is a large continent and land reform varies from country to country. Is there a common thread that we should start talking about or do we need to go region by region? If there is a central theme, it has to do with differences in land tenure. For example, uh, in South Africa, there is fee simple ownership of land, but not in Nigeria. In Nigeria, land belongs to the state. What is bought and sold is the ability to use the land. From that, from th those differences, extend many consequences. For example, in South Africa, land can be a store of value. You can buy it, you can sell it, but you can also mortgage it, which means you can use it to raise capital. All of those activities are much more difficult in a country like Nigeria. So it's going to vary considerably from place to place. Okay, let me come to you, Mr. Metho. You gave a testimony to Congress, to the U.S. Congress recently, and you called land reforms, uh, I'm sorry, land grabs, life grabs. Can you explain what you meant? Thank you very much for giving this opportunity. I, I think that as uh, what I call, why I say that, land is what the African really depend on for generations. Uh, for instance, me, I was not raised by the salary from the office. I was raised from the money from the land, from was raised from the land. So when I grew up as a child, my family used the land for our survivals. So like the parents before me and the people before that. And I think this is happening in all over the place. So when I call it a life grabs, it's really taking the life and then destroying the life and taking the future of these people. Because what it is, is these people, the powerful elders, like, you know, the, the colleagues say before me, the policy, some of the places, the land is being owned by the government. And then the, whatever the government say, then the people have no say. So anyone who have been living in that land for generations, the government will leave that land and the people will be displaced and then that will be the end of their life as we know it. So I call it life grab because it take away the life and the future of the people who have been depending on that. And you're taking away the future of the children as well. I want to come to you, Mr. Ayete. What he mentions is land grabs. International investors are also blamed for that. But there's also lack of land reforms. I know these issues are connected, but what do you think is the bigger issue here? Well, I think um, uh, we have to make some kind of a distinction mm -hmm. uh, between land reform and also land grab. I think, you know, if you look at Zimbabwe and South Africa, there, you know, it's, it's right, it's proper to talk about uh, land reform because uh, uh, the, uh, <coughs> um, <coughs> a large percentage of the arable land is in the hands of whites. In South Africa, it's about 80%. <laughs> in Zimbabwe, uh, the and, and, and just to remind our viewers, uh, <coughs> while you take a sip of water, that this is June 2013. 
uh, exactly 100 years ago in June 1913 was the Land Act passed in South exactly. Africa yeah. that led to about 85% of land being, uh, yeah, being owned exactly. by whites. Yes. So. Okay, so there, you know, you, you need reform so that you can uh, sort of uh, redistribute land, you know, uh, some of it to the blacks who are there. Okay, so that's a separate issue. But in other parts of Africa, you have land grab. Land grab uh, because, now this is how it is coming about, you know. Uh, as the ambassador said, <coughs> in Nigeria, in uh, Ethiopia, in Mozambique, in Angola, the government owns the land. And uh, the government in recent years have been able to, you know, sell vast tracts of land. Um, <coughs> something like six, uh, 60 million hectares, you know, without the consent of the people. In some cases, people have been driven off their land, so it's not really land reform to say. And you they're know. selling it to international um, <clears throat> investors. investors? Yeah, I agree. Other countries or just big commercial investors? Well, big commercial investors, and they come from all over the place. They come from Asia, they come from Middle East, they also some of them come from the West. And just for clarity, are they selling it, selling it, or are they leasing no, it? No, they lease in it, you know, but, you know, the rates of lease is so ridiculous. You know, you can lease uh, 200,000 acres of land. You know, uh, at the least rate in Cameroon, at the least rate of, say, $1 per for 2.5 acres for, for 99 years. It's ridiculous. Which is nothing. Which is nothing. <coughs> we'll come back to this issue. Ambassador Campbell, uh, we talked about land reforms being uh, historical injustice, as uh, we were just talking about, especially in South Africa. 85% of the land owned by uh, the white farmers. But redistribution is not as simple as all that, right? We saw in Zimbabwe that a radical redistribution led to massive drop in GDP of the country, something upwards of 30%, almost close to 40%. So what are the big issues here? Well, the big issues are, how do you reconcile historical injustice, the maintenance of the rule of law, and food security? South Africa has a land reform program. Uh, up until fairly recently, it was based on the principle of willing seller, willing buyer. That is to say, land reform was dependent on individuals having the ability to buy the land. And in most cases, that meant the borrowing the money from the government. This means the government faced the fundamental issue of, does it use revenue for land reform, or does it use it to build hospitals, schools, improve roads, and so forth? But it's also related to the issue of food security. Joe Slovo, who was a member of Nelson Mandela's first government, notoriously commented that he had no interest in destroying Africa's most developed commercial agricultural sector in order to create a class of African peasants. Okay, so let me, let me bring Mr. Metho in here. Mr. Metho, I want to uh, ask you, how do you balance this equation? On one hand, you have, as Ambassador Campbell was just saying, a really well-developed agriculture sector. On the other hand, you have these poor farmers who've been working that land for decades, for generations. They don't have the money to buy it. How do you balance that? Uh, I think that's a very good, uh, that balance should be coming from the government. The government, in most of the case, I think as uh, Dr. Aiti said, they are leasing the land without consulting the people. Transparency, accountability is not there. And so the balance should be the government supposed to be the government for the people. And they should find a way to make sure that people are included. In most of these cases, usually I call this, what's happening in Africa now is the second scramble for Africa. And in that case, what I'm saying is the decisions are being made, made by the elite in most of the case, autocratic regime, which is not elected by the people, which is the concern of their people, is the last thing to think about. In that case, then it makes it very difficult for the people to speak up. In just a case like of my country, in Ethiopia, 
you know, where the countries, the media has been controlled. The people cannot speak. The indigenous people have been driven from their land with the promise that they will be giving a job. In most of the case, no one really know even what they did in contract. A contract of 300,000 acres of land for 99 cents, for 99 years, you would think that the people would be consulted. In the West, in North America, where we live, if you buy the so car... So you're, you're, you're talking again about the issue of land grab by the government and giving it to international investors. I want to bring you in, Mr. Ayete, uh, on this issue. A, does the government have the kind of resources to re redistribute land at this scale, at the scale that's required? And then tell me a little bit about Zimbabwe and what went wrong there. The government did it. They well, did redistribute land. Well, you know, the thing is, uh, uh, the land reform program in Zimbabwe was badly, if I may use the term, screwed up. Badly screwed up because, um, you know, I mean, there's no question that there's land inequality in Zimbabwe. And as the ambassador said, you know, one way of, you know, redistributing the land, you know, there were blacks there and the land uh, was forcibly taken away from them. One way of redistributing it is, you know, to use the uh, um, buyer willing, seller willing sort of principle. If there is a, you know, if there is a, a willing seller, and there is a willing buyer, you know, maybe the government could lend, you know, the buyer some money so that you can, you know. But uh, in Zimbabwe, there were war veterans who claimed that uh, for their role in the liberation struggle, they were entitled to some land, and Mugabe was not, you know, giving them the land. And as a matter of fact, funds which were set up to compensate the veterans was looted. So the veterans got angry and they uh, forcibly invaded white commercial farmland and seized the land by force. This is what created the turmoil that you see in Zimbabwe. Okay, now we need to keep talking about this issue because it's very complicated, but it's time to take a short break. We'll be right back. Voice of America, 1,500 hours of news and information, educational and cultural programming to more than 134 million people worldwide each week. Listen to us on radio. Watch us on television. Follow us on Facebook or Twitter. And through your mobile device. VOA. We're dynamic and consistent. In bringing you the most reliable information in 43 languages. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Welcome back to On The Line, I'm Aisha Tanseen. For many Africans, land reforms are supposed to make up for the injustices of the past and secure their future. Yet decades of promises by their governments have gone unfulfilled. To discuss the issue we have with us, George Ayete, President of the Free Africa Foundation, Ambassador John Campbell, former U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria and presently with the Council on Foreign Relations, and Obang Metho, Executive Director of the Solidarity Movement for New Ethiopia. Ambassador Campbell, I want to come to you. Do the African governments have the resources required to redistribute land at the scale that it needs to be done? Uh, in virtually all cases, no, they do not. However, in the past, in some cases, the international community has stepped in. Particularly, for example, at the time of Kenyan independence, foreign governments made available, essentially as a form of aid, uh, money to the new Kenyan government, which it then used for land reform. That's a very interesting point, Mr. Meso. I want to come to you. What do you see as the responsibility of the international community at this point, especially given that some of the things you said in your testimony refer to human rights violations as well? Yes, I think the international community really have to make this regime, autocratic regime, accountable. You know, in that testimony, I used an example, my own countries, where, you know, really they have been committing a human rights abuse displacing, you know, almost 250,000. They are planning to displace in the next four years. Four million people are supposed to be displaced as a result of this land grab. And so what we are trying to tell the donor countries, the human rights should be protected, the human rights of the indigenous people who live there. And also that, again, I think that Ambassador put it very well. What is, you know, the, this is beyond the government ability, but the government can do something. Because what we find is, as you always, the law has been written by the powerful. The powerful are the government in this case. And sometimes land grab, when we are talking, not only the rural people, 
even is uh, taking place in the urban as well. And so, West, you know, the Western donor countries who really funded these countries should make sure that the right, the right of the indigenous people are protected, not just looking over it, because that's why I call it a live grab. At the end of the day, going to destroy the life of these people. Okay, let me bring you in, Mr. Ayete. What do you think is the responsibility of the international community? And add to what Mr. Metho has said, do you think the international community is taking on that responsibility? Well, you know, uh, first of all, the international community needs to be informed. And as the ambassador said, the international community, in the case of Kenya, they contributed some uh, funds to allow, you know, land redistribution. They did exactly the same thing in uh, Zimbabwe as well. Some funds were provided to allow the government to purchase land from the white farmers, you know, for redistribution. But get this, you know, one thing which happened in Zimbabwe was that, you know, Robert Mugabe's regime, you know, bought the land and redistributed it to his cronies, not to the uh, peasants or people who deserve them. So there was no transparency in the program? There was no transparency in the program. And in the case of land grab also, the people's human rights have been violated. They are not as uh, compensated. They are not allowed to make an input. In the case of Tanzania, for example, even the Maasai tribe, you know, they are, you know, they face extinction because they have been driven out of their land. You know, their lives have been uh, destroyed and their land being made available to wildlife tourists, you know, for uh, uh, rich uh, tourists from the Middle East to come and shoot lions and wildlife. You know, there's something basically unfair about this. So you're saying this is happening because the international community is not informed or is it a Either willing they conflict? are not informed or uh, they, they are refusing. Well, this is one of the reasons why programs like this are important so that we can bring awareness to the, uh, to the issue. Ambassador Campbell, is the international community not informed or is it a willing culprit in this case? Well, when you talk about the international community, it depends who you're talking about. Uh, obviously, experts on land, excuse me, on land questions and on agriculture are indeed informed. But are governments informed? And further, in the list of priorities that any government has to face, where is land reform in a foreign country going to fall? I want to make a related point. Land reform is extremely expensive. It's not just simply a matter of buying land and turning it over to the landless. If land reform is going to work, the recipients of the land have to be given sufficient support so that they can turn themselves and the land into productive farms. Okay, well, Mr. Metho, I want to bring you in here. As Ambassador Campbell said, it's a very expensive uh, project. If the recipients are not ready to till that land, it can mean serious drop in GDP, it can mean hunger, it can mean poverty, as we saw in Zimbabwe. What, what yes. should... Go ahead. Please. I think Ambassador, you know, really is right. But again, as, as I said earlier, that, you know, if we really want the reform, the reform should be for the betterment of the people, not the betterment of the few. In this case, you know, the governments, again, I repeat, that this is one of the problems. The land reform that we are talking about sometimes is being done by the government that which is not elected by the people who doesn't even care about their own people. In that case, only those in the government, the crony government, elite the autocratic, they are the ones that who can sell the land, can lease the land, and local people are not involved. So and then we... They're then not really, uh, okay, le, uh, let me take that issue a little further. You're talking about um, governments that are not elected, but the African National Congress is an elected government, and they have not been able to fulfill their promise. Uh, Mr. Ayete, what went wrong there? Well, you know, it's, uh, they're trying, but, you know, land reform, according to the President Zuma, is coming along, but slowly. Very slowly. Very? They were supposed to have 30% by 2014. Yes. We're now way into 2013, and we're, what, 8%? Yes, you know, it's so, uh, that, there's a problem there, you know, the South African government um, may claim that, you know, there are also other issues, it may not have sufficient money to accelerate the process, but I, but, uh, I should make a point that, uh, that Oban was uh, making, and that is, and, and that is that, you know, <clears throat> the ambassador made the point that, you know, you can't redistribute land from one productive use to less productive use, otherwise it will affect your agricultural production. It is true, but you see, it's an argument which has been used to uh, block land reform uh, in Southern Africa. It can be, you know, it, 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 it can be a problem there, but it can be overcome. 
How do you overcome it? It can, it can be overcome in the sense that, okay, look, you don't necessarily have to lease, you know, take the land away from, let's say, a productive farm or white farmers and give it to the poor person. You can say that, okay, look, there has been a historical injustice, okay? The land which the white farmers are using are not theirs, okay? So let them pay some rent on it and use the rent to compensate, you know, the poor black farmers. That is something which can be worked out. Okay, Mr. Metho, very quickly, because we're coming to the end of the program, if South Africa does not accelerate the pace of land reform, do you think it can have a Zimbabwe moment where people just take over the land? I depend on the government. That's for sure, you know, we cannot rule that out. Because really, human being, you can push people to the edge, but they will get to the point where people will take their matter in their own hands. But in the case of the South Africa, because of the government there, I don't think that that will happen. And we are talking about all this, you know, South Africa. There's other places as well where the, is the, the people who control or who have the land is not the white people, it's African of African or a one particular tribe controlling. So in that case, what is needed is, is awareness, like, which is something that really what you are doing in this show is an excellent. And we are also trying to do this in September to try to have, you know, in Washington, D.C., you know, partnership, African League and Solidarity Movement. We are trying to so, engage a diaspora to let people be aware about this kind of thing and talk about it. The more we talk about it, the better to make sure that it does, you know, what happened in Zimbabwe does not happen in other African countries. So, as I said in the beginning, a very complicated issue. There are lots of angles to it, and we will bring it up again, but I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank our guests. George Ayete, President of the Free Africa Foundation, Ambassador John Campbell, former U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, presently with the Council on Foreign Relations, and Mr. Obang Metho, Executive Director of the Solidarity Movement for New Ethiopia. And thank you for joining us. Please send us your questions or comments, or watch our past shows on our website, voanews.com slash on the line. We look forward to hearing from you and hope you'll join us again next week for another episode of On the Line. Every day, she fights an incurable disease that can literally take her breath away. You're like, okay, this needs to stop because I can't breathe. I'm just coughing. Next on Discoveries and Breakthroughs, see how this young woman is making every breath count in the battle to stop cystic fibrosis in its tracks. For 28-year-old Mindy Seiler, something as simple as a breath of fresh air can trigger a debilitating attack. You're like, okay, this needs to stop because I can't breathe. I'm just coughing. For all her life, Mindy's battled cystic fibrosis and symptoms that frequently put her in the hospital. My stays range from 23 days all the way up to 55 days, depending on how bad my lungs are. In CF, a chemical imbalance causes a buildup of mucus that blocks vital airways inside the lungs. What happens with CF is they don't have as much chloride on the top side of cells in their lungs, actually throughout their body, and that causes a drying of the lungs. Tracking that drying generally involves an invasive test called a bronchoalveolar lavage. Under general anesthesia, a tube sprays fluid into the lung. The fluid is removed and tested for key inflammatory biomarkers. Nice, relaxed breathing. Now, pharmacists and medical experts at the University of Arizona are working on a new test, analyzing the tiny atoms exhaled by the patient to check the wet or dryness of the lungs. The goal, a less invasive test that could lead to better management of CF. I would hope eventually, um, um, as it's fine-tuned, a more regular test. Um, I tell people um, so kind of like a glucometer for diabetics to see um, if any of the markers are going up before pulmonary function declines. Mindy knows she can't stop her CF, but she's one young woman who's not giving up. As long as I'm here, I'm going to fight and do everything I can to live as long as possible. I'm Alex Kane reporting.
The Parthenon in Athens is one of the best known landmarks in the world. Towering over central Athens on Acropolis Hill, it is known to be one of, if not the actual, birthplace of democracy. Built at the height of Greek civilization in the 5th century BC, the Parthenon remains an enduring reminder of its achievements and an architectural masterpiece that has influenced countless constructions ever since. Completed around 440 BC, the Parthenon was originally home to a huge golden ivory statue of the goddess to whom the city was named and the temple was dedicated, Athena, the goddess of wisdom. Besides being the site of many superb interior and exterior artworks, its architects and sculptors were masters in science, mathematics and art. They created a building with perfect proportions. Its horizontal planes were imperceptibly curved, creating an intricate optical illusion. All Greek temples of the time were designed to be seen only from the outside. To viewers who could only glimpse the interior through its open doors, the columns appeared to float. The achievements of ancient Greek civilization remain an enduring inspiration to present day Greeks. Some, as seen here, even continue to practice their ancient religions, praising, among other gods, Athena and Zeus. For two millennia, the building survived numerous disasters, both man-made and natural. But in recent decades, the Parthenon has had to battle two modern scourges, chemical pollution and tourism. Tourists' feet were eroding the marble floors. In the mid-1980s, with the support of the European Union, an ongoing restoration program began. Engineers took the two and a half thousand year old temple apart piece by piece in order to restore the building to something of its former glory. Then culture minister, the late Melina Mercuri, oversaw the restoration program. The Greek government and the Greek people are doing in the Acropolis are the most important. Uh, because for us, as you know, as I have said a thousand times, the Parthenon means for us uh, our soul, our sense of democracy, our uh, identity. And uh, sure, the Parthenon belongs to everybody in the world, but first of all, belongs to the Greeks. Mercury began lobbying the British Museum for the return of friezes and sculptures from the Parthenon's facade, the so-called Elgin Marbles. In the early 1800s, then British ambassador to Greece, the Earl of Elgin, Thomas Bruce, received a controversial mandate to remove the Elgin marbles from the Ottoman Sultan. In 1816, they were purchased by the British Museum, where they have been ever since. And with the focus of the world on Athens during the 2004 Olympic Games, lobbying for the return of the marbles intensified. Athletes from around the world joined the cause. Scotland has a great heritage and I think it's only right that the Greeks should um, safeguard their heritage and uh, you know unfortunately it was a uh, Lord Elgin that took the marbles and I think it's appropriate for me to say that they, sh they should come back. The return of the Elgin marbles has become a cause celeb. In early 2007 students from around Greece circled the Acropolis as part of the return the Elgin marbles campaign. Now with the completion of the museum near the Parthenon it is hoped the British Museum will one day agree to the marbles' return to the site, which was their home for more than 2,000 years.